It's amazing. We are the creators of our own world. We can make our imagination a reality. Anything we say or describe simply happens. Like magic. Until it doesn't. And that is usually when we build our programs, when we try to compile, run, or test it. The only remedy to this situation is the build tool. My name is Leonard Tamolde. I use Gradle as my build tool. And hopefully, after today's presentation, you will consider the same. I'm a software engineer working at Chillit. We are a proud sponsor of this conference today. We have a stand. Come look for us with the red chili peppers. Pretty easy to spot. I'm currently uh, on an assignment for KPN IoT, where I work as a backend Java developer. I've also spoken at JSpring this year and in J last year as well, so you might have seen me before. Before saying anything else, I would like to quickly recap who this talk is for, hopefully for all of you. But I designed this talk specifically for people who have both never used Gradle, but I've heard of it, obviously have used Gradle, but are currently using something else, and you would like to know, has anything changed? Should I reconsider it? As well as people who are actively using Gradle, but maybe haven't exactly taken a look at some of the latest features, which we'll be looking at as well in this presentation. And then possibly as well for Gradle power users looking for an ego boost. Our agenda for today is as follows. First, I'm going to give you a very, very brief overview of build tools. I assume most of you already know what this is and what they look like, so I'll keep it short. We're going to talk about what Gradle is uh, in a fundamental, conceptual way. And I believe this is something that even many users of Gradle don't fully grasp. And once you do, everything starts to make sense. Then we're going to look at specifically the power of Gradle 8 and what it can do for you and some of the uh, opportunities that it gives you for improving your own build experience. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about why you should use Gradle with the Kotlin DSL. So let's start with an overview of build tools. History is the old title, my apologies. There are several ways you can build software applications. A long time ago, we might have done this with basic shell scripts or even make files. Some of you might have heard of or even written these. I'm fortunate enough to have never legitimately used makefiles. And of course, there is uh, build tools like NPM, which I think is probably the most widely used build and dependency management tool in the world. But there's one thing in particular about NPM that I really dislike. And it's not actually what's on the screen right now, which is the content of your build file. It's that. This build file, which is so compact and simple, is apparently so complex that we need to use a different interface, a CLI, to modify it and install dependencies. <sighs> OK, maybe that's a bit unfair. I actually really like NPM. And JavaScript is my second favorite language to program in. It is also the only language I dream about. And when that happens, it's called a nightmare. Right, but this talk isn't about any of that. It's about Java and the Java ecosystem. And in the Java ecosystem, there are two tools that pretty much everyone uses. They are Maven and Gradle. I won't try to compare them directly too much in this talk, because that is not the purpose. But to start it off, I do have to mention what they have in common. So they have a lot of things in common. The main way they differ is the way that you describe your build. In Maven, this is done via XML, so configuration. You're not using a command line, but you're configuring your build in XML. And Gradle chooses a domain-specific language, which means that you get the compactness of, well, having a very domain-specific format. And you also get the flexibility of having a full programming language at your disposal. And you can choose two flavors, Groovy and Kotlin, and the reason I'm giving this presentation today is because about half a year ago, 
Kotlin became the new default DSL language for Gradle, which means that this is now the one that's picked by default and that you're encouraged to use, and it comes with several benefits. But they also have a lot in similar. They both do dependency management, and they both do this primarily via Maven repositories. Of course, the Maven central repository is the primary place where you can grab any dependency from. They also do automated testing and reporting, and of course, publishing your artifacts when the build is done. Finally, they're also both very modular and extendable. Both have a plugin architecture and allow you to break your project up into multiple modules. So these are um, hopefully some points that illustrate that both tools are very competent and there's not anything necessarily wrong with using either one of these. But I still think you should give Gradle a shot. So let's talk about what Gradle is then. Gradle is a built automation tool, which when I read this meant particularly nothing to me. And it works by having a hierarchy of tasks. And this sounded very duh to me when I first read it. But when I actually dove into it a little bit, it started to make quite a lot of sense to me. The way it works is that tasks are configured via a domain-specific language. And together, they form a hierarchy. So they each depend on another. And because of that, a graph is created that uh, when you run a task will instruct the build program exactly what steps it has to take to get there. And that is really all there is to Gradle. And I really like that because it doesn't have all of these different execution methods that uh, tend to make things complicated. It also provides reusable build logic via plugins, which we'll get into as well. So what does the task hierarchy look like? Oh, there was an image there, but it's gone. Well, just imagine a nice graph structure. <laughs> right, where basically you have one uh, task and it depends on another task to be completed first. So you, you want to test, well, first you have to compile your test, and for that you have to compile your main code, and for that you have to verify and process resources, etc. So what does it look like to make a building Gradle using the Kotlin DSL, which is what I'm going to use all throughout this presentation today? Well, it's pretty simple. A build.gradle.kts file is the main file for your uh, Gradle builds, and it looks like this. You can simply register tasks, in this case, hello, where you can print messages anywhere, so at the root level inside of your task or inside these do first and do last clauses, and they will be executed when you run the build. So you might expect you'll see hello jfault2023 when you run it, except you get the reverse. And that is because there are three different stages in which Gradle runs your program. First, your program is initialized, your build program. So all of the code inside of the root, so the 2023, is ran. Then your tasks are configured, and the code inside of your task will run. And the reason is that you might want to use custom logic to derive configuration properties for your tasks. And then finally, the task is actually executed, which begins by running the code in do first, then actually performing the logic of the task. But this is an untyped task. It's just called hello, so there is nothing. And then it will run the code in do last. And if you understand this, then you pretty much understand all of Gradle. OK, but what does that mean? What can you do with it? Well, let's define some more tasks. We start again with the hello task, and this time we just have do first, which means when the task executes, do this first. Then we define a property, and a property can be overwritten via the command line. It defaults in this case to hello, and this is just regular Kotlin code at our root level. We define a second task, and this one has a type. It's an exec task. It depends on the hello task defined right before it, and when you run this task, it will actually run a command line, cow say, with a certain message specified. When you run this task, it will first run the hello task, because that's defined as a dependency. And then during the execution, the command line will be executed. I was going to explain that line by line, but I didn't end up doing that. So when you run it, you get the following. 
you'll see that if you run the cowsay task, which we've defined, it runs that task and the hello task on which it depends. This is really nice. But you can do even more. And to do that, I've looked into giving a bit of a live demonstration. I don't know if it's going to work with the uh, screen mirroring, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway. Here we go. And it's making it everything very, very big. Wonderful. Oh, boy. Well, there we go. Let's set the scaling to 100%. All right. Hopefully, this is readable. Let's go into a project I have here. And here, I could have done the same to find these same tasks and I've done all of that, but I've already prepared some stuff in Git to take a look at. So let's uh, go to our version control. Um, yes. Let's go to the final branch. So here I have to find essentially the same task, but what I've also done is to find a group and a description. And this is very useful because if we now run the Gradle command by saying Gradle, I'm going to add offline because I don't have an internet connection, and rerun the tasks, you now get to see the task in here. Uh, it's under build task. We have the cowsay task. Were I not to put these lines in the task, you won't see it in your build configuration. So if you are making tasks that you want uh, to use via the build script, you should add a group and a description so they can be properly listed. As you can see, it's gone now. This is very useful because it also means you can build tasks that are kind of designed to support other tasks and are hidden. If they're hidden tasks, just don't put these parameters in. If you want to use them via the command line, then you do. But there are some more things you can do. Um, I've spoken about Kotlin, and Kotlin has some very specific advantages. Uh, namely, it allows you to get all the IDE integration that Kotlin has. So if we check out this branch, all right. There we go. I've done something interesting here. Let's uh, refresh our Gradle build. What you'll see is that because this is a Kotlin script, and Kotlin has very powerful support inside of IntelliJ, you get um, type safety, of course, and auto completions. So this is a feature I'm going to talk about a little bit later in the presentation. But if I want to add a dependency on, let's say, Apache Commons, I can actually go to my manage libraries via libs. This is what's called a version catalog. I go to Commons, and then I can see lang3 add it in, and with auto-completion and type safety, I can add dependencies into my project that are managed centrally. So this is one of the benefits that you would not get with Groovy because the IDE support just isn't quite as good. All right, let's get back to the presentation. So I've kind of spoken about most of these topics. Let's go to the next slide where we're going to talk a little bit about the CLI. So you've seen me just use some Gradle commands. I think it's important to talk about. The Gradle CLI, which is what you get when you install Gradle, is useful mainly for one thing, which is creating new projects. When you create a project with the CLI, it will create a wrapper, which is a tool that wraps your Gradle executable and, all, and downloads it automatically. And this is very useful because um, Gradle builds are not always fully backwards compatible. Gradle tends to break things. Their development speed is more iterative, and they release new major, major versions quite frequently. So very often, you're going to want to have a specific Gradle version be used in your build, and wrappers can help you with that. If you want to know more about it, it's in the documentation. To create a project, it looks a little like this. You start with Gradle init in an empty directory, and then you tell it what kind of application you want to make, and it scaffolds a whole bunch of things for you. I'm not going to try to get too far into that right now. Then 
what you'll get when you run this is the following application. You'll get an app directory, which contains your actual application, and a build Gradle file, which is like the files we've just looked at. This is for Java, of course. And you're going to get a source and a test directory, as well as the actual wrapper, which again wraps a specific version of Gradle, making sure that anybody who runs it will get a build that works. Then finally, there is one more file, the settings.gradle.kts file. This is the only file that's required for a Gradle build to work. So if you want to run Gradle from a directory, it needs the settings file because it explains where your projects are and what the root project is called. And that's really the only thing you have to put in your settings.gradle file. So it just needs to look like this, essentially. Your root project has a name, and it includes the app directory as a subproject. All right. Looking at the build.gradle that we get if we generate a Java program, it has a lot more stuff in it, and it can look a little bit intimidating, but it really isn't. You just get an application plugin, which is a plugin for a Java application. So this will produce a runnable jar file. And it has a main class. That is something about applications. If you just want to make um, a Java program that produces a jar file, you can also choose the Java plugin or the library plugin. You define your repositories. And unlike in Maven, where you get the central repository for free, here you have to manually say, I want to be able to use dependencies from Maven Central. The same goes for Maven Local. You also have to specify that. Then you get dependencies. And here is the first really big difference. First of all, dependency declaration is much more compact, as you can see in these short strings. And it includes the group ID, uh, artifact ID, and the version inside of it. But you also see implementation and test implementation these are the scopes of your dependencies, and they work a little bit differently than they do in, for instance, Maven, where implementation just says, I need this code um, at both compile time and runtime, but you've also got runtime only and compile time only options. And then if you're making a library, there's another scope called API, which says, I want to use this, and I also um, don't want to expose this to the class path of the application that's using this library. Then you have the Java toolchain system. This is a different way of managing the Java version of your build. With the Java toolchain system, Gradle will automatically try to find a Java GDK installation that meets certain criteria on your system. And this is very useful because much like Gradle, Java also now tends to break between builds. I'm sure anybody who has ever upgraded to Java 17 or 21 knows that if you try to run an older project with this Java version, it's just not going to work. That's why this is very useful. It will automatically, in all of the standard locations and registries and directories, try to find a Java installation that will work with your program. Then there is configuration specific to the application plugin, because the application plugin defines its own tasks. Again, everything comes down to tasks. You can configure it via the application property. And in here, you can use uh, main class.set. Main class is a property. And in Kotlin, you have to call .set on a property to set it. And then last, you can overwrite uh, settings for specific tasks. In this case, the test task, which is also provided by the Java plugin, where you say, I want to use JUnit uh, to run my tests. Now, I just said that main class and language version 2, actually, are properties, which means you have to use dot .set. This can be a bit confusing, because in some places, when you define a variable, you use the equal sign to declare, but with properties, you use dot .set. Well, in the latest, latest version of Gradle that just came out, you can now actually just use the equal sign, and that tends to make things a little bit more readable. You don't actually need those quotes around the outside, either. So this is just brand new. All right, so that's the basics, and hopefully, even if you already knew a lot of this, it's a nice refresh to understand how the task system works, how it relates, um, how the tasks relate to each other, and how the dependencies and the task overview work. But now I want to talk about some of the new coolest features inside of Gradle. And that's, I think, the following. 
first of all, you have some new tools for doing shared build logic in a more advanced and interesting way. Uh, you have some new tools that make your dependency management easier, one of which we've already actually looked at a little bit. And then there's some things Gradle is doing to enhance performance over other build systems. Let's get started. So before we can understand um, what the benefits are of sharing build logic, you first need an actual use case for this, and that would be a multi-module setup. If you only have one module in your application, sharing build logic doesn't make any sense because you only have one build file. So you need multiple ones. To do this in Gradle, it's as simple as going into your settings.gradle file and changing the include line to include the directory of a second Gradle system. And again, this module will just need a build.gradle file, and that's it. Then you can run tasks in specific modules by prepending the command with colon followed by the um, directory name of the module. So if you want to run the run tasks inside of your app, you run the second command and publish the uh, builds in your uh, lib project, you run the third command. Pretty basic. And how do you share logic so that you don't need to declare the Java version and the repositories and all of these dependencies in each of your modules, right? Maven has pretty solid systems for this. Gradle did too for a long time, but more recently, this is the, uh, the way they recommend you to do it. There is a special directory in Gradle called build source. And if this directory exists, it's treated as an independent Gradle project, which means this is uh, one of the few cases where you get to see a second settings.gradle.kts file. And this is built kind of as a dependency to your main build scripts. And inside of here, you can define what are called convention plugins. And there's one of them in here, which are the Java common conventions. So in here, you can put all of your configuration that you want in all of your Java modules. So what does that look like? Well, much the same, right? You have your Java plugin being applied because all of our Java code wants access to all of the Java features and the tasks that come along with it, like test and build and jar, et cetera. Define your repositories in here. For instance, we want Maven Central, but maybe you also want access to the Sona type snapshots. Just put them in here, and now any module that uses this conventions plugin can use it. Of course, your Java version and your dependencies. Um, but any dependencies you declare in here will be automatically applied to each module. You might not want that, but still to manage the version. And to do that, you can define dependency constraints. And one of them is defined right there for Apache Commons Text, where you can say, when Commons Text is used, I specifically want to version 1.10.0. So that's a constraint, right? If this uh, dependency is present, I want the following version. Yes. Then you can also, of course, uh, configure tasks with specific types. So any compilation tasks should have preview features enabled, and the same for test. You can actually define additional task tasks besides the default one that you get. Um, maybe for your integration tasks specifically, you want a separate task to run these. Using selectors like these, you can apply a configuration to all tasks of a specific type. And then you can also do it by name. So maybe on the main test um, task, you want to use JUnit, but because you don't know that every different test task is going to use JUnit, you only apply it to one's name test. Now, naturally, if you go to one of your modules, you can add the plugin like this. You just include the file name. Into your, in your plugins with backticks around it. And now all of the configuration from the previous file is applied to the current module. And hopefully you can already see that this is really great because you don't just have one plugin with conventions, you can combine multiple of them. So this gives you a lot more flexibility than something like having a, a parent from which you inherit information because you can import from different kinds of plugins and combine functional plugins with these convention plugins and do all kinds of interesting things. 
And now because that dependency constraint is present, if we now specify comments text as a dependency without the version, we're gonna get that version that we specified in our conventions file. If you want even more power, it's a good idea to design a custom task. You can do this in Kotlin code, but it will so in Java. You don't actually have to be a Kotlin expert to use the Kotlin DSL with Gradle. I certainly would probably choose to write my uh, custom tasks in Java over Kotlin, um, because that's the language I'm most confident in for imperative programming. So configuring your build, kind of doing that kind of stuff is very doable in um, inside of your build.gradle file, but very complicated logic, like for instance, if you wanted to make your own deployer script, you would not want to write all of that code, maybe the entirety of all your C CDK configuration for AWS inside your build.gradle file. If you want something very specific and you actually want to program out large bits of functionality imperatively, you can do that by creating custom tasks like this. And then when the task runs, the code inside the task action is ran, and you can also specify properties to allow this task to be configured. Then you can simply register a new task with your task type, and you can configure it via the properties that you've set inside of your task. And this is great for, again, uh, features that you want a custom task for that require a lot of functionality and are impossible by default. And these can be in your build sources too, or you can publish them as a plugin to a repository so they can be shared across multiple projects. And I think this is a much better system than what many other build tools do for sharing uh, configuration, which they do via conventions, or specific functionality via tasks. Then there is advanced dependency management. So Gradle gives you some tools for improving the management of your dependencies. First of all, you have dependency constraints, which we've already seen a little bit, but there's a bit more I want to say about them. Then version catalogs, and this is another feature that was just introduced in Gradle 8, so it's brand new, and it plays very well with Kotlin's DSL. And feature variants, which allow you to say, um, maybe I have different features within my library, and you can pick which one you want, and that might change the underlying sources or dependencies that are included. So maybe, you're making a, a data access library and it supports a MongoDB variant and a SQL variant, right? So dependency constraints, you've already seen this, so I won't elaborate too much, but you can also specify version ranges, not just versions, and this is very useful if you're making a library that's compatible uh, with, for, for instance, specific versions of Spring. You can define that with a plus, or you can use the bracket syntax to define ranges. Then, to use it, again, you just specify the, uh, the dependency name, but without the version this time. Right, then we have the catalogs, and this is actually um, a feature that I teased right at the start when I was inside of IntelliJ. What you can do is, in your settings.gradle, you can define dependency resolution management which changes how Gradle resolves your dependencies. And you can define version catalogs, which will create a type safe object called libs in this case. And inside of there, you can define libraries with, again, range constraints. So in this case, we're saying between 3.8 and 4.0, and even a preference. So if it, if it doesn't matter to our dependencies, if, all, if they're all compatible with both of these, with 3.8, 3.9, and 4.0, then pick 3.9. So you get a lot of flexibility. And then in your code, you can access this as an object and get completions, and you'll get very solid error reporting when you, for instance, remove a library from here so it's no longer present. And you just get better error reporting when you execute your build, and you can immediately see which libraries are available and managed when you're writing out your build file. And this is the power of having the Kotlin DSL, which has the solid ID integration. Right. Last thing I really want to talk about for Gradle is the performance. Gradle has always cared about performance and try to optimize this in various different ways. 
In fact, Gradle 5, which came out, came out quite a while ago, has been compared against Maven 3.6 by Gradle, I should say. So take this with a, maybe a tiny grain of salt. And you can see it's fast for running clean builds, um, running builds from the cache, and even compiling a single change, so having very solid incremental compilation. And there are some really cool techniques Gradle uses, um, Gradle utilizes to achieve this, and this continues to improve with each new release. And you'll find that even now, Gradle 8 will perform significantly better with incremental compilation than Gradle 5 would in most cases. So how do they do this? Well, for one, Gradle has a daemon running. And this is very interesting, because it means that when you start your build, it doesn't just run a build with inside of a program and then exits. It will start a, a background process, a, a daemon for Gradle, that will run your builds from that point onward. And this means that Java, which requires a bit of time to start up and optimize and go through um, all of the optimization steps to make it as fast as possible, has the chance to improve over time so that on your next builds, it's going to be faster and faster. Then you have incremental builds and compilation. This means that if a task doesn't have to be re-executed because the input of the task hasn't changed, for instance, for a compile task, the input would be the source files, doesn't have to rerun it. But it can also do incremental compilation and figure out uh, which source files have to be recompiled and which can be reused. And this can, it can do this very effectively by even comparing the ABI so that if you make a change to the content, to the body of a method, but its um, interface hasn't changed, then the modules that depend on this code don't have to be recompiled because they're using something that's compatible. So this entire subproject won't have to be recompiled. And this makes incremental builds a lot faster. So if you just change one file in, in a project with a lot of code, um, only a tiny bit will be recompiled. Then they have a virtual file system. What this is is because you have a background service that's constantly running, you can use this to optimize the build process because, because you can detect while you're still programming and editing these files which files have changed and how that impacts the configuration of your, of your build so that when you rerun your build, all of that information will be present. Sorry, I'm just taking a look at the time. I think we have 10 more minutes. I think we're actually good on time then. Then there's the build cache. The build cache is a very advanced performance feature in Gradle that enhances your performance by storing uh, results from previous runs. And you might think, well, that makes sense, right? If I run the same task twice, it doesn't have to do all the work again. But it goes beyond that. Not only, which is standard, can Gradle look at your last run and then reuse results as much as possible, but it can store results from multiple builds, and it can do this locally and even remotely. And I'll explain why that's so cool in a second. That is an opt-in feature, by the way, so you won't get that by default. Then the configuration of your builds themselves, which is, of course, also defined via scripting, is also cached to improve performance. And you can configure parallel builds so that multiple different modules can run in parallel, which further speeds things up. So the build cache is a feature that's not enabled by default. You can opt in by passing build cache to your arguments or enabling it in your properties. And it speeds up, like I said, your local builds by reusing outputs, such as when you switch Git branches. So maybe you're, you're trying to debug an issue you keep switching between these different branches. And normally, in a build tool, because a lot of the content changes when you check out a different branch, it would throw everything away and start over. But Gradle, with build cache enabled, can see that I've actually ran these builds in the past, these tasks with these inputs, and it can reuse those results. So especially when you're switching between different branches of work rapidly, um, each time, it won't recompile or retest anything that it's already ran or tested before. 
It can also speed up your CI builds by not running tasks twice, even across different pipeline instances. And those results can be shared with developers working on a program, so you won't have to compile or test any code that's already been uh, compiled or tested inside of your pipeline. So approaching the final thoughts for this presentation, why should you consider using Gradle for your next project? Well, there's sometimes I think you shouldn't. One is what I like to say, don't rock the boat. If you're in a team or in a large project that's already using another build tool, again, most build, modern build tools in Java are fine. So if that's what's used everywhere, and it's a lot of work to change it, by all means, don't go running out and migrating everything unless you have a very good reason to, and it's a big issue to you currently, um, your builds. Also, don't change it if you're comfortable with how your builds are. If you're using Maven and you really like it and everything I've just told you about doesn't sound that exciting to you, don't change it. If you prefer the flow of having executions and phases and goals and how that all interacts with each other and it doesn't confuse you, congratulations, um, then don't change it. Right? Maybe just having tasks is, uh, is too simple. And another thing, and this is actually a really, really important one, is if you value stability over usability. So Maven has one major benefit, which is that it's incredibly stable. It really doesn't break much at all, even between major releases, ever since Maven 2. So usually, you don't have to worry as much about needing the exact version of the build tool, needing the ex exactly the right version of Maven installed, because if you just have the latest version, pretty much any Maven build will just work. And over time, you won't have to change your builds just because the newer version of Maven has removed a feature that you were using. These are all good reasons not to switch. And this also goes for other build tools, but I'm only mentioning Maven specifically. But otherwise, if these situations don't apply, then if not for the compact and concise build information that you get with Gradle. If not for the performance of your builds that you get when you use Gradle. If not for your ability to extend and set conventions and effectively share build logic between each of your modules. And even if not for the advanced transitive dependency management with version ranges and type safety, or if not for the elephant mascot, which I think is better than just the letter M, then because, because we're not users of graphical user interfaces to do our builds, we're not people who just run commands to install dependencies and, and do things like that, we're not people who just configure something in an XML file. That's not our job. We're programmers. And we should program our builds so they can have bugs too. <laughs> That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. Um, Again, come say hi to us at our stand and uh, leave a review in the app to let me know what you thought and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you very much, everybody.